camera. I've gone ahead and created the shape drawing for our subject today. This is the same as we would have done in the shape drawing in lesson one. So if you need to review or need a refresher on what's involved in creating the outline or shape drawing stage, I highly recommend that you review lesson one video from last week. The oval portion of the ceramic pot I created by, again, as, it, er, as shown earlier in the video, I put in a horizontal and a vertical line very lightly and then adjusted the shapes until I had them correct. I then extended that vertical center line all the way down through the pot very, very lightly because it's not actually in the pot, but very lightly so that I could then go down through the drawing once I had completed the shape and I could check the distance on one side of that center line against the distance on the other side of the center line. I can repeat that check as many times as I want to all the way down through the length of the pot to confirm that our proportions are indeed accurate. I can then also make corrections at any point that I find that there's an inaccuracy. Before I start introducing any tonality at all, I want to make sure that the curve on this side is identical to the curve on that side since this is a symmetrical object. That is, that the shape over here is identical to the shape over here and the proportions are the same. The next thing that I did in the drawing was to very lightly map out some of the tone shapes that are occurring in our subject. So I have the secondary highlight that's reflected off of the tissue in this area over here. I've got the two primary highlights that are in the foreground here and I've got shifts that occur from this plane into the shoulder and then into this plane. From this plane into this plane. Those all start to come out as we start to introduce the tone today. And then finally I very lightly put in a general shape for the cast shadow that comes from the ceramic pot onto the table surface and I put in a horizon line in the background where the edge of the table plane meets the, the vertical plane of the wall. As we introduce tone, um, I highly recommend that you keep a spare sheet of paper handy. This will be a, a buffer so that when you put your hand onto the paper you're not going to accidentally pick up some of the graphite and start smearing your drawing. For today's drawing I'm going to begin by starting to introduce a tone into the cavity on the top of the, the ceramic piece itself. Be careful with your edges. If you can freehand and still continue to keep the edge, that's great. If you ha find that you have difficulty with it, don't hesitate to experiment with that fingernail tip that I, I gave earlier. Remember too that we're working from the tone of the paper, which in this case is white paper, for most of our drawings would be white paper, toward our darkest darks. We want to reserve the darkest darks for the very end of the drawing process when our observations are most accurate and we're most likely to put those into the right place. Dark tones obviously are much more difficult to erase than light tones and therefore we want to put them in, if at all possible, we want to put them in one time at the end of our drawing and then move on. You'll notice that I'm shifting my hand around the drawing as I work on it. If you can do this without difficulty and discomfort, go ahead and do the same way. If, however, you find it awkward to turn your hang hand to other angles, then don't hesitate to actually turn the sheet of paper. I can take, if I find it easier to work like this, I can do that. For example, in re-establishing this edge. Now at this point I'm also going to mention something else I haven't uh, mentioned previously, and that is contrast. For our purposes, contrast is going to be the difference between two or more things. In this case, it's going to be the contrast between darks and lights. Contrast works for us 
in creating the illusion of space and volume in a drawing. This drawing is actually a flat sheet of paper. And it's marks on that flat sheet of paper, but we can allude to the three-dimensional form of our subject through the use of tone and contrast. As a general rule, the greater the contrast, the more the area will pop forward in our vision. The weaker the contrast, the more it will appear to recede back into the background. Okay, earlier I delineated the shape of those highlights, so now I'm going to start introducing a little bit of tone in around that to eliminate the white of the paper everywhere except in that area where I want that highlight to be. You'll also notice that as I introduce this hatching, I'm deliberately changing the direction of that hatching so that if a viewer, in my final drawing, if the hatching still appears there, the viewer will understand from the pattern and the direction of that what's happening with the form. This is a turning form, the little outside lip of this, or shoulder of this portion of the ceramic. Our light source is coming from this direction over here, so as we move around onto this area, we're moving into shadow. And again, I want the, the contrast to be greatest in the area that's closest to us, so I reserve our highlights for the area that's closest to us. And in this case, I reserve our core shadow, our darkest tone, the shadow within the shadow, again for an area that's closest to it. I'll have the core shadow here with it getting a slightly darker shadow, uh, sorry, slightly lighter shadow as it comes around to the edge there. I notice that this shoulder here is actually casting a shadow onto the shallower shoulder around here. Coming down into this area again, I want to reserve the white of the paper only for that area that's highlight. As I introduce this tone, I notice in the pot that this area is slightly lighter than this area. So I also come back in and bring that up just a little bit. Again, working from the white of the paper, the light of the paper, toward our darkest tones. You'll notice to get these long strokes, I'm actually holding the pencil back at the very end of it. In doing that, I'm encouraged to use my entire arm instead of just my fingertips. And that will then describe a longer, straighter stroke, whereas if I hold it up here, choking the pencil in effect, then the finger movement, or the movement rather, is in the fingertips, and it, the arch or movement tends to be more arched. Again, you'll notice that I change the directions of the lines as I move into different planes within the, the cylinder so that the direction of my marks is describing the direction of the surface that we're looking at. If you remember back to my original demonstration of mark making, you'll notice that I'm using the first type of marks that I demonstrated. This is a very fast way to work with a pencil and it allows me to test my observations. If my observation turns out to be accurate, I can develop it up further as I've done up in the opening here. But if I'm mistaken, I've discovered that mistake very quickly, very early on, and I have plenty of time to then correct it. It would be much easier to erase this, this hatching than it would be a continuous tone like up in here. If you think about tonal drawing as being similar to working in a sculpture, building a sculpture out of clay, we're gradually adding more and more clay with each stage. Now, as I built this up, initially I left this secondary highlight the white of the paper, but I observed that this isn't really as light as these highlights over here. So what I want to do now 
is to go ahead and reduce that so that it's no longer the white of the paper. And then to maintain that original shape, I'll now start introducing some darker tones. I want to avoid flattening out my shape, my form though. So as I get darker with these tones, I'm going to reduce, I'm going to move in from that outside edge. And reserve my darkest tones as I did up here. Reserve the darkest tones for an area in the foreground rather than in the background. At this stage, we've got most of the white of the paper covered. We've eliminated all areas that are not going to remain the highlights. We're still working toward our darkest darks. I've introduced, early on, I introduced a dark tone up into the upper cavity here and everything. So that acts as a guide of how far we can push graphite. Uh, for our purposes, we'll think of this as our darkest tone. Most of this area down in here doesn't have a tone that dark yet. We're working in that direction, but we have successfully eliminated areas, broad areas of paper where we don't want to have white. We know that already, and we're starting to introduce the variations in tone. So we've got the beginning of a tone through here that grades off into a lighter tone as it comes into the light. Down in here, we've introduced the uh, shadow area, but you'll notice that it's not particularly dark at this point, and we still have a few areas to work. For example, down along the edge of the bottom of the pot, you can notice that we, although we've introduced tone into, on both sides of this, neither one of them being as light as this area of pure white paper out here, we also don't yet have an actual tone shift. So I want to go back to observing my subject. And what I observe is that this area of the shadow that's closer to us is actually darker than this area up in here. I do observe that this area of the pot is darker than this. But when we get down here, I notice that because light is hitting the tabletop and reflecting up into the bottom curve of the pot, that in this area, we actually have an area outside the, the pot in the cast shadow that is darker than the, the pot itself. So we're going to introduce a darker tone here. You may also have noticed that I actually changed directions not only with the curve of the pot, but also the plane itself. So for example, I opted to go with a horizontal hatching in the background of the table plane and having that hatch then fade out into the white of the paper as it comes into the foreground. When I started in on the wall though, I went with a vertical neither the horizontal of the table surface nor the curved hatching of the pot so that I can immediately see that as a separate plane. Even if later on in the drawing I decide to blend all of that using a q-tip or whatever, I use it initially because it helps me in my own mind to see these planes as different from one another. If you find that that's a useful tool, by all means I encourage you to use it as well. Again, I'm still holding the pencil back at the tip. I want these strokes to be long and as straight as possible. But I also want to reduce the pressure. If I was choking up on the pencil, like a, a batter choking up on a baseball bat, um, the tendency would be for me to put more pressure more quickly. This way I, I know I can get darker because I can always move forward on the pencil and apply more pressure to it, thus getting darker. You can get dark in two ways, simply by filling in more, actually three ways, filling in more of the paper with the hatching or blending, like with the Q-tip, or by increasing pressure or a combination of these. Now, if you remember back to lesson one, I mentioned that, sorry, at the beginning of lesson two, I mentioned that we eventually want to replace these lines with tone shifts. And we don't want to get too dark too quick with those lines. In order for me to replace that line, I have to introduce into the dark area a tone that is as dark 
as that line. The moment I do that, as you can see here, the line disappears and is replaced instead by a tone shift. One other thing that I'm doing is I'm also going to have a darker tone in the cast shadow here and I'm going to move it to a lighter tone as I come out here. The reason being just as back there. Some of the light coming through the blinds, in this case the ones over my shoulder, are actually coming in and filling this area, softening. So the farther away from the object the shadow moves, the lighter that shadow becomes. Okay. At this point, most of our tones are in. In fact, all of our tones are in in their basic location. And I've taken a break from the drawing to sharpen my pencils one last time. The reason for this is you'll get your darkest marks and your finest edges from a sharpened pencil. A dull pencil is more rounded on the tip and will have a tendency to splay out as far as the application of tone. At this stage, we're doing more observation, less drawing. We've got most of our edges. Uh, most of our shifts, tone shifts in there and everything. So I'm going to take one last look through and I'm going to look specifically at my edges. Anywhere that I see a, a line that's separating two light tones relative to its own darkness, I'll want to do a bit of fine tuning. So for example, I'm going to come up back up into the upper lip here and I'm going to very gently add a little bit more tone into that area. I'm also going to, oh, and I mentioned earlier this sheet of buffer paper that we keep in here. If you have not used this in the past, and if you are not using it today, in today's lesson, and you're wondering if you even need to do that, I suggest that you take a moment to look at the heel of your hand. If the heel of your writing hand, in this case my right hand, if you're left-handed, look at the heel of your left hand. If you look at the heel and you've got graphite on there, you are smudging your drawing, moving drawing from the area where you want tone to be, and probably moving it into areas that you don't want it to be. I highly recommend that you get in the habit of using that. It'll save you a lot of erasure time later on. Now at this point, I'm going to go ahead and flip the drawing around because what I want to do with my sharpened pencil, I want to come back in and I want to crisp up this outside edge right in here and then I want to flick a few more marks in there. Now, how far? Oh, one other thing that we can do, that dark tone that we introduced there, we can come up into these little grooves that are on the underside, sorry, the grooves that are in the, the face of the, of the pot, and on the underside of it, we can also introduce a little bit of that tone, that same dark tone, that will be darker than this area over in here, and again will help to pop that forward. Final stage, as I mentioned earlier, more looking, less drawing. We want to look at the overall drawing, see if there's anything that jumps out at us as needing a bit of fine tuning. I haven't done any blending with the Q-tip today simply because I wanted to keep this as direct as possible but what you end up doing should be based on what your interests, what your goal is. So if you want a very very polished drawing the next step would probably be to get out the Q-tips and start doing a little bit of blending. But be judicious in that. Remember that blending is the same as running the heel of your hand around. You're moving graphite from one area to another. You don't want to overdo it. If you end up moving graphite from your shadows into your light tone areas, your drawing is going to go flat on you. So be judicious. Be careful. Selective. Um, the way I frequently uh, talk about drawing to my students is I say that uh, drawing is like a golf game. The fewer strokes, the better. Well, that's about all the time we have for today. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did, and that you'll join me again next week for Back to Basics.